Thanks, Sam, and, and thanks to the Norwalk Historical Society for inviting me to do this, and thank you all for coming. Uh, to get right into it, Sheldon's Horse, 2nd Regiment Light Dragoons. Allow me to begin with a citation from the book, Washington's Eyes, The Continental Dragoons by historian Bert Garfield Losher from the chapter de dedicated to the 2nd Dragoons. The 2nd Dragoons exceeded the personification of the ideal type of Dragoon. They not only fought and won victories on horse and foot, but on the water as well. They were also the key to Washington's espionage service. None of the four light dragoon regiments surpassed Sheldon's horse for uniquely active and effective service. Too little has been written of the impact that Sheldon's Connecticut horse had in the, had in the American Revolution. Well, since that citation was written in the 1970s, the knowledge of the second dragoons has increased. Uh, in all manner of ways. It's become the topic of a video game. It was the subject of an AMC series turn and a three-part novelization series by author Sandra Chen, uh, who at one point was um, uh, involved in the Connecticut Historical Society before moving to California. So they are the first congressional cavalry regiment in the history of the United States as authorized by the Continental Congress and commissioned on December 12, 1776 by George Washington. Now, why is it that the first commissioned cavalry is designated as the second light dragoons? I am, I am so glad you asked that question. It has to do with politics, 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 and location, location, location. Congress gave the honor of the designation of being the first dragoons to a regiment from Virginia being Washington's home colony. However, when the commissions came through, Sheldon was with Washington in New York, and so the second was able to receive its commission before the Virginians did. Now, one of the things, the second Jagoons um, exists today in a reestablished form, and we do uh, field presentations and educational presentations. And invariably, one of the first questions that is asked is, just what is a Dragoon anyway? Well. It's a soldier trained to fight on foot as an infantryman and as a light infantryman and on horseback as a cavalryman. And what made a dragoon a light dragoon was the stature of his mount. In Europe, they had heavy dragoons. They had big robust horses because there's a lot of open plains and fields in, in Europe. Here, it was more of a wooded environment. And so you needed a lighter mount, a smaller mount to be able to navigate through the semi-wooded terrain of, uh, of the new world. Now, this is our typical wearing apparel. And I will tell you that these boots are not made for walking. Now, why are dragoons called dragoons? Well, there's two speculative answers for that, both based upon the French word for a dragoon, dragon. And the first is that a man on horseback wielding a fire spitting stick appeared to be a dragon like creature. And for some of the more well to do people, uh, they would have the jaws that held the flints on their muskets carved into the head or cast in the head of dragon's heads. Now, these are the images under which Sheldon served. We have the regimental device on the top left, which translated to the regimental flag on the upper right and then the Betsy Ross flag on the lower left and the Tarleton Bedford flag uh, on the lower right, which uh, that will be subject of some further discussion later on. And Patria Conchita Fulminatus Nato stands for the nation calls her sons respond in tones of thunder. That center boss, uh, center image of the, uh, of the sun, the winged sun with the lightning bolts coming out this is the benefit of Benjamin Talmadge going to Yale and having classical education. Uh, that image goes back to the second century Greek hoplites who had that as a boss, center boss on their war shields. So what type of functions did the dragoons perform? Many, ranging just from starting with recruiting and training, patrolling, intelligence gathering, messenger service, supply guarding, commissaries, supply routes, flanking, screening, combat, ambushes, espionage, and guarding Washington and serving on his staff. 
And how many men served in the Second Dragoons during the second during the war? All right. So the regiment, even though it never served as a whole, it was the largest of the four congressional or regular dragoon regiments, with a maximum roster of about 416 men. And overall, some 700 men passed through the ranks during the course of the eight years of the war. And the things in which the second was first, first commission cavalry served as the first Pony Express running messages uh, from outpost to outpost and uh, to wherever, where, wherever Washington was. First cavalry charge on American soil by a regular American cavalry unit, the Battle of the Flocky. Uh, as part of the Saratoga campaign uh, in August of, of uh, 1777. First organized US espionage system with the culprit spiring and the only regiment to achieve victories on foot, horseback and at sea. And nicely enough, the last of those um, uh, on water victories occurred off the Norwalk Island. So let's hear it for the home team. <laughs> Now, here we have the creation of the American Dragoons and I credit three individuals, Governor Jonathan Trumbull, Colonel Elisha Sheldon, and his, elect, his Excellency General George Washington. Now Trumbull, 1710 to 1785, he was the Royal Governor of the Crown Colony of Connecticut, State Governor of Connecticut uh, after independence, and the only governor to side with the rebellion and only colonial governor to remain in office throughout the war. And he had himself served as a state dragoon officer in 1732 in a state militia regiment. Now here was a guy who could read the quill writing on the wall. He defied the Royal decree against manufacturing. He created an ironworks or he took over an ironworks in Salisbury, Connecticut, started casting cannons and muskets. Um, uh, against the Royal Edicts, uh, began the manufacture of committee safety, muskets, pistols, bayonets, and music, uh, munitions, established his war office near the family home in Lebanon, Connecticut. Now, I've been there, man. It's, like, it's right off the Lebanon green. Talk about an enviable commute, because here's a guy who could walk out his front door, walk about uh, 300 yards to where his former business office was that he converted to the war office and go about doing his business. And he divided Connecticut into military districts, each with a company of uh, infantry, artillery, and a troop of horse. And here's his war office. It is a uh, state historical site today. Uh, we all know who this guy is, General George Washington. Now, at first, he did not see the need for a mounted component to his army. In fact, um, what had happened was he had requested troops from the surrounding states to come to his aid in New York, and Trumbull sent infantry and cavalry. Well, the cavalry guys, they behaved kind of like the fighter jocks do now. They did not want to do the regular details that soldiers had to do, foraging, getting wood and water, uh, doing guard duty. They they thought they were too good for this. And their horses were eating up an inordinate amount of resources in terms of hay and oats. And so Washington sent them back to Trumbull with a note saying thanks, but no thanks. But after the Battle of White Plains, <clears throat> when he saw how effectively the British were able to use their light dragoons to cut off, corner, and entrap um, uh, American regiments, he decided maybe I need to get me some horse guys too. So he requested Congress to authorize a mounted corps. And he assigned Major Elisha Sheldon of the 5th Connecticut Light Horse Militia, the task of creating a corps of cavalry on the Continental Establishment. And this really worked out well for Washington because the early attempts in the war by British, or British sympathizers to kidnap him would fail because the second dragoons were always with him. Good thing for all of us, he changed his mind. So the 5th Connecticut Light Horse Militia was part of the contingent sent to Washington in late October of 1776. And they performed so well during the fight up uh, Manhattan Island and the retreat through New Jersey that Washington decided that Sheldon was gonna be his guy. And we're gonna talk about Sheldon more, but briefly, 
He was the son of a Connecticut legislator, also named Elisha Sheldon. He was a boyhood friend of Ethan Allen. In fact, they both got kicked out of their church in Lakeville, Connecticut, uh, because they defied the civic and um, uh, clerical edicts against being vaccinated for smallpox. They elected to do it on a Sunday in front of the church, in front of the whole congregation. And so they were invited to leave. So he started serving as a captain in a state light horse militia regiment as early as 1768. <clears throat> and of course, as has been mentioned a couple of times, was commissioned uh, to raise the troop of uh, Connecticut horse on the Continental Establishment. And he would command the second dragoons throughout the war. Now that may sound really nice, but as we will see later, there are issues. So let's talk about briefly uniforms and equipment. Because let's face it, clothes make the man. So here we have the clothing, leather, uh, leather knee breeches, high leather boots, short jacket, brass helmet, cut down musket to a carbine size because you need to be able to maneuver the musket musket over the top of the horse's head without clocking them between the ears, something to which the horse strenuously objects. Also carrying a, uh, a sword or saber and a, uh, a belly box with ammunition. And here we have Thomas Young Seymour modeling the brass dragoon helmet. Now, one thing about Thomas Young Seymour, it's good to have a friend who is an artist. And he was a friend of John Trumbull, son of Jonathan Trumbull, and appears in so many paintings uh, by Trumbull that uh, he could start his own um, uh, card collection. But the brass helmet is, uh, is not only protective uh, or decorative, uh, but is protective. There's an inside suspension system that keeps the dome from sitting directly on your head. The race center crest acts like a crumple zone on a car. If you're smacked in the head with a heavy object that will collapse, but the head's protected. And the horsehair crest, horsehair is slick and it's hard to cut and it's braided. So that increases a tensile strength. And so if you're struck in the back of the head with a, uh, with a sword, it just sheds that sword blow off the back of your helmet. And here are the, the basic tools, a uh, flintlock carbine musket. It's about eight to 12 inches uh, shorter than a standard musket, uh, a bayonet, uh, pistols, sword, cartridge box. You can see the, the rolled up cartridge. Uh, cartridges would contain either one musket ball or a buck and ball, which would be uh, a musket ball plus pellets. And later in the war, uh, Washington authorized the use of the blunderbuss for use of troops on horseback. And of course you need teeth. If you don't have two opposing teeth, you can't bite the top off the cartridge, you can't ac access the ammunition and you can't load the firearm. And if you can't load the firearm, you can't kill your enemy. So they're smooth bore, uh, which means they're not rifled because of the fouling that builds up on the inside of the musket barrel as you continue to fire, the musket balls had to be undersized. So when you pull the trigger, if the gun goes off, it's bouncing around on the inside of the barrel. And so it's very inaccurate. Uh, a good part of the uh, explosive power of the gunpowder is lost because of that. So they're heavy, they are inaccurate and they don't shoot very far. But other than that, you know, what else can you ask for? So here is the front view of the lock uh, without, the, um, uh, without the flint in the draws, draws and a look at the inside of the lock uh, from the musket's point of view, looking at the workings of the lock mechanism. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, first off, a crack British regiment could fire four times a minute. And these guys were at the top of their game. They were like the best army in the world. Um, the Americans, after some serious training, could get off maybe three rounds a minute. If you're trying to load on horseback, your rate of fire is even less than that. So 
you're not you're not putting putting out a lot of a lot of firepower, which is one of the reasons why the infantry was so dense packed creating a human shotgun to make the most of a bad situation. Okay, so they were an unreliable weapon system. Black powder is susceptible to the weather. If it's raining, if it's damp, that stuff gets wet, it'll clump, it, it will turn to sludge and it won't ignite. Wind can blow the priming charge out of the priming pan. It can blow sparks away from the priming pan. So even if your powder is in there, the sparks might, might not get to the powder. Subject to flash in the pan, which is when the priming charge goes off, but the main charge in the barrel just sits there deciding what it wants to do. Uh, your powder supplies may be adulterated. I know you will be shocked, shocked to know that the tradespeople, the suppliers, the manufacturers would adulterate the gun. I, I can just hear the, the, the surprise in your voice and the look on your face that, that manufacturers supplying the army would actually do something like adulterate the gunpowder. Shocked, shocked, I say. Flints may fail to spark. Flints go dead. At some point, they just lose their sparking power. And the frizzins, which is the metal piece that the flints strike to make the spark, they're like an M&M. &M. They've got a hard shell on the outside, but a softer core on the inside. And if you erode away that, that face, because what the flint does, what makes the spark is it's shaving little pieces of metal off that uh, the face of the of the frizzin, then you get to dead metal. And instead of it going hit spark, it just goes thunk. So unhardened frizzins may fail to spark. You need to take them to a, to a blacksmith and, and get them case hardened. Uh, hang fire. You may pull the trigger and the, the, the priming charge goes off. But the main charge in the barrel just hangs around for a while. It can, it can sometimes take a while for it to work its way through to the gunpowder on the inside to expel the musket ball. We were at a firing range in, um, in Danbury a number of years ago, Wooster Mountain Gun Club. And a friend of mine thought he had a misfire. His priming charge went off. So he went to his car to get a ball puller. It's like a double bladed corkscrew to pull the musket ball out. He set the musket down on a, on a log, aimed down range. He went to his car. He stopped at the clubhouse to get a soda. Five minutes later, he's walking back to his musket. And as he reaches down to pick up the gun, it, it discharges. So that was like a five minute hang fire. So that is something that can happen occasionally. And subject to just an outright misfire. It's just the gun is just not going to go off that day. And in the excitement of combat, you may wind up, the, the soldier may wind up uh, not realizing that his gun didn't go off and just keep putting more rounds down in the barrel. Uh, there was one battlefield where they found a musket with 10 loads in the barrel. And for a, a cavalry soldier, you're gonna carry a sword or a saber. The difference between the two is a sword is straight and a saber is a curved blade. Now, 18th century steel tended to be brittle. So swords were made by two kinds of guys. You had swordsmiths or bladesmiths, and you had blacksmiths. Now, if your sword was made by a swordsmith, bladesmith, their forges are designed to run up to temperatures of 2,500 to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So they've got the heat necessary that when they're banging on that metal ingot, they're not just shaping the blade. They are taking out the impurities from the iron ore and blending in charcoal from burned bone material or, uh, or burnt wood, charcoal. So that's what makes good high quality carbon steel. So if your sword was made by a swordsmith, you're in good shape because that's, that's like the knives, the good carbon steel knives you have in your kitchen. Those blades will flex. You can give them a wrap on the, on the edge of the counter and they'll bend, but they won't break. But if your sword was made by a blacksmith, their forges don't run as hot. Consequently, it has more impurities and less carbon. So they tended to be brittle. So if you've got a, a blacksmith made blade 
and go up against an enemy with a good carbon steel blade and you whack together, your blade could crack, snap off, and then you are left with a stumpy thing on a handle. Also, they were not cutting weapons uh, for, for that very reason. Uh, if you hit the edge of a blade that is uh, a weak blade, that is the weakest part of the weapon. And again, you're apt to snap the, the blade uh, and wind up again with a stumpy thing on a handle. And they weren't stabbing weapons because if you're on horseback and you insert your sword where, somebody, where nature never intended it to be in the first place, you and your enemy still have the inertia of motion. And you can lose your sword uh, if, it, if it decides to not come out of your opponent's corpus, or you can get uh, pulled from your horse and, and then you're in really bad shape in a combat situation. So they were used as blunt force trauma weapons for the most part. And uh, as my captain, my captain is endlessly reminding us, a dragoon without his sword is just one thing, a dead man riding. So now you're equipped, you got all your weapons, you got your ammunition, it's time to train. So you start to train in tight formations as a battalion company, uh, shoulder to shoulder, uh, learning to maneuver in that kind of block formation, fire mass volleys, forming that human shotgun to try and take out the enemy. And then you learn to fight as light infantry and in open order as skirmishes using natural terrain, actually hiding behind rocks and trees on occasion, uh, if that's what the situation calls for, especially if you're holding an ambush uh, open for uh, enemy soldiers that you uh, know uh, happen to be coming down the road. <laughs> and then, you know, a horse, because you're a cavalry guy, you have to have a horse. Now, I'm. this particular painting is by Pamela Patrick White. Um, this is taken from a photograph of our second dragoons uh, at a place called Jerusalem Mills uh, in Delaware uh, at a uh, battle recreation that was uh, held some years ago. So you're looking at a painting representation of what our guys looked like then. Now, the Mounted Dragoon, a boy and his horse. Um, the horse is basically divided in two, front and back. Everything the trooper needs to do his job, which is training, patrolling, combat, is mounted to the front or to his side. So the pistol holsters are at the front, his cartridge box is to the front, his sword and his carbine are slung to the side. You need to keep your focus on where the enemy is coming from, and generally that's going to be from in front of you. The stuff that is not necessary for those tasks are mounted behind the trooper on the back of the saddle, his saddlebags, his bedroll. Um, saddlebags would contain uh, a couple of days worth of grain for the horse, uh, his munitions, uh, extra munitions, his extra clothing, his food, um, all that stuff that he doesn't need to hurt other people is gonna be behind him. And speaking of horses, Horses have a six foot blind spot directly to the front. Yes, it's, I would not lie to you about a horse having a blind spot six feet to the front. They are prey animals. Their eyes are set to the side, which is an indicator of a prey animal. It gives them better peripheral vision um, so that they don't become lunch to a predator, uh, but their eyes don't focus to the front until six feet out. So you can walk up to a horse, stand directly in front of him. You can pet his nose. He'll smell you. He'll hear you, but he's not going to see you till you step back. Humans are predators. Our eyes are set to the front. If you have children, you know that all too well. <laughs> this allows for stereoscopic vision, depth perception, and focus. So when you have a human on horseback, you have a situation that's unusual in nature uh, of a predator animal and a prey animal working in unison with one another. So both the horse and rider have to train. Horses are um, not in a big hurry to be around the man-sized creature. So you have to train them to be more comfortable uh, with that kind of activity. So you start with the hay head. 
which is a pole with a clump of hay on it at about the height and size of a man's head. And the, you take the horse and rider through the permutations of the rider learning to keep his balance as he approaches the hay head, working with sword and pistol and getting the horse to go along with this without, uh, without being reticent. Uh, and without fearing that his rider, with whom he is forming a bond, trusting that the rider is not going to put him in a dangerous situation, which of course is the thing you're training him to do. Uh, so they train with the pistol, they train with the sword, and then ultimately the hand-to-hand -hand combat sword training between mounted, uh, mounted riders. And then mounted and dismounted elements train together. Typically, uh, there were problems securing enough horses for all of the four congressionally constituted cavalry regiments. At best, of the six troops of the Second Light Dragoons, four were mounted and two were dismounted. All were dressed and supplied the same so that if a mounted rider was killed or wounded and came off his horse, one of the dismounted guys could take his place immediately without having to stop and change his clothes and get a different gun. Uh, so they coordinated the activities of both the mounted and dismounted elements. They all had to be comfortable working together. And what you're seeing here is the dismounted portion of the company has just fired a musket volley at, at an enemy and the horsemen are prepared to charge through the open ranks uh, to attack the enemy with their swords. So here we are, everybody's ready. <clears throat> and these are the services that the second Dragoon saw um, post commissioning on December 12, 1776. Uh, Battle of Trenton, Second Battle of Trenton, Princeton, Ridgefield, Woodbridge, New Jersey, Short Hills, Battle of the Flocky is part of the Saratoga campaign, uh, the debacle at Brandywine, the successful battles of Saratoga, uh, the loss of Germantown, uh, Battle of White Marsh, where two troopers were lost, uh, Rawdon's action in Pennsylvania, Rising Sun Tavern, skirmish outside of Valley Forge, Battle of Monmouth, uh, Claps Tavern Road, which is now King Street on the border of Greenwich and, uh, and uh, Porchester, New York. Uh, the burning and battle of Pound Ridge, uh, which uh, the more that's researched, the more of a significant and larger action that turns out to be. Uh, battle of Norwalk, one troop under Captain Stoddard uh, came down from Wilton Parish to the defense of Norwalk and were able to hold up the uh, the Hessian column in West Norwalk for about three hours, which really threw off uh, Gov uh, Governor General Tryon's timetable, forcing him to go back to his boats with much less success than he anticipated, even though they did a number on Norwalk. Um, Battle of Newtown was kind of interesting. That was, um, actually I should say Newton is what it was because it's out near Elmira, New York. In 1779, because of stuff the Native Americans did uh, against American um, uh, uh, townships in New York, central New York and northern Pennsylvania, General Sullivan took a task force west along the what's probably the southern tier highway of uh, uh, New York now. The roster lists 40 sharpshooters from Colonel Sheldon's cavalry regiment. We don't know who these guys are. A comparison of rosters, we have been able, not been able to figure out who these 40 guys are. All we know is eventually they were folded into Spencer's New Jersey division as, as part of that whole um, uh, action out west. But they did a number on the Native American villages uh, and camps 
destroying uh, destroying their homes, burning the crops, chopping down the orchards, uh, and basically forcing those Native Americans, largely Shawnee, farther west. Two very successful raids on Long Island, um, Tarrytown. Uh, 20 of our troopers were with Washington at the Siege of Yorktown. Um, again, another action on Long Island. And uh, these last three actions, uh, two off of Norwalk and uh, one off of Stratford Point. Now, 1779, it was a very big year. It was the year the Connecticut coast went up in flames. The British went dragoon hunting. The second Dragoons was so successful across a broad swath of activities um, from, from stopping uh, loyalist freebooters on the neutral ground uh, between Westchester and uh, the northern tip of Manhattan, running espionage operations. Um, the, the second Dragoons were hunted by uh, various British cavalry regiments and could rarely stay more than one night or two in the same place for fear of being caught. And it, again, it was the year Americans went Indian hunting with Sullivan's expedition. So as said, uh, Sullivan went after the Iroquois Confederation with 40 of Sheldon's Dragoons. Um, Tryon <coughs> in 1779, uh, in February 1779, he raided Greenwich. He called the people in Greenwich swamp rats because they had this tendency of hiding their, their whale boats uh, in, the, in the reeds in the swamp and then going out after uh, British cargo vessels. He also wanted the horses in, uh, in North Greenwich because as much as the Americans needed remounts, the, the British did as well. Uh, at the beginning of the war, you could buy a good quality horse for $100 and by the end of the war, you could buy a horse for lover money. So um, in starting in July of 1779, Tryon raided uh, New Haven, West Haven, Fairfield, Greens Farms, and, uh, and Norwalk. Uh, one change to this panel, instead of July 9, it's actually July 2nd, when Tarleton uh, caught the second Dragoons in Pound Ridge. They were expecting, uh, per Washington's orders, uh, that uh, cavalry from Colonel Stephen Moylan's 4th Regiment of Light Dragoons, they were being sent to Pound Ridge to bolster American troops in the Bedford area. Their uniforms were very similar, green uniforms with red facings and cuffs. Uh, they were very similar to the troop uh, uniforms worn by Tarleton's British Legion which was green coats with black facings and cuffs. How this came into play is on the night of July 1st, as Tarleton's men moved out from Miles Square in, uh, in Armonk, uh, it was raining. Nobody expected, I mean, they, the second Dragoons were expecting an attack by Tarleton. They were not expecting it in the rain, but they were expecting Moylan's men. The pickets on the far side of Bedford came back into Pound Ridge to say, hey, there's cavalry coming. And everybody thought it was Moylan's. Talmadge rode out with a squad of his troopers to greet Moylan. And they got halfway between Pound Ridge and Bedford when surprise, it's not Moylan, it's Tarleton. Gunfire ensued, which is a good trick in the rain, but somehow it was the, the guns went off. And Sheldon, back at the headquarters in Pound Ridge, was able to get his men mounted just in time to be hit on three sides by Tarleton's men. It was a melee. You had 200 of Tarleton's men on horseback, plus another 150 light infantry on foot. Sheldon had 90 troopers. So if you're familiar with High Ridge Road, where it, where it meets um, uh, where it goes up to Pound Ridge and meets the Bedford Road. That whole section of road from the plant nursery, which was Talmadge's headquarters, down to Scott's Corners in North Stamford was a running fight with 
some 300 men on horseback crushed into a narrow defile for that entire roadway, fighting tooth and nail. Uh, Sheldon's guys are just trying to survive it because they are overwhelmed more than two to one. Uh, a British trooper takes a swipe uh, at an American with his sword. The American backhands him with his sword, cut his mouth open from ties to side to side and dislocated his jaw. That guy comes off the horse. An American, another American trooper is hit and just grazed in the forehead with a musket ball from one of Tarleton's men. Tarleton's guy yells at him, another, a little closer and you would have been dead. The American yelled back, another inch and you would have missed me altogether. If you're familiar with Scott's Corners, they got as far as Trinity Pass Road where they were bolstered by men from the 6th Connecticut Light Infantry under uh, 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 Major Leavenworth and the, the uh, Pound Ridge Militia. They were able to stave off Tarleton's men. By this time, Tarleton's men, they had marched through the night. They had been going for 20 hours, men on foot, men on horseback, horses all spent. They realized they were not gonna get any farther after Sheldon's men. They turned around and started their way back. Sheldon pursued them for a while, but having just been through this hellacious fight and melee, men and horses were tired. Um, an American doctor and a British doctor set up a field hospital in Lockwood's home, which is the site of the plant nursery building now. Um, and the wounded were tended to the dead were buried. And then after all that was done, Tarleton and his men set fire to the house. They also captured from Tarleton, his horse, his saddlebag, clothing, payroll, uh, the, uh, the uh, secret ink uh, for writing messages for the culprit spiring and this flag in the lower left corner. That was taken back to England by Bannister Tarleton, along with three other flags that he captured later down south, Battle of the Waxaws, cow pens, what have you. And in 2006, his linear descendant, Captain Christopher Tarleton Fagan, decided he wanted to sell them uh, because the upkeep was just getting to be too much. So they were put on sale uh, for auction at Sotheby's in New York, Flag Day of 2006. Uh, they had hoped to get uh, anywhere from 600,000 to maybe a million and a half for this flag. And imagine our surprise. Uh, we went down as a, some of us went down as an honor guard for the flag for the auction. Uh, we were invited. We didn't just go. Um, but that flag sold for twelve and a half million dollars to an anonymous donor, uh, anonymous buyer who bought the other three flags as a single lot for another three and a half million dollars. They were put on display at a museum in Colonial, uh, just outside of Colonial Williamsburg for 18 months. Uh, we don't know where they are now. The anonymous owner has taken them. He owns them. He's doing what he likes with them. But the only proviso that he gave was that they would never leave America again. And here is a depiction by Don Troiani, a superb military artist uh, of the fight uh, between Tarleton's men and Sheldon's men at Pound Ridge. And if you just look, he has really caught the essence of, of what that fight was like. Now, these did not happen in isolation. These were all part of a plan to A, try and lure Washington out of the highlands. That didn't happen to kill off the second light dragoons, which didn't happen, but also to keep everyone on edge while Tryon did what Tryon did along the coast during that first week of July, up to and including the burning of Norwalk. Now, they did a lot of damage to Norwalk, but one of the things they didn't get was the supplies at the warehouse belonging to Norwalk merchant Eliphalet Lockwood, uh, who was the assistant commissary for this region and supplied the Second Light Dragoons as well as other militia and regular regiments of the army. 
Um, despite the damage done, they never got to his warehouse. And within two weeks, the commissary records show that he was able to continue supplying the, uh, the military elements in the Norwalk area uh, practically without interruption. Now, the second dragoons also were involved in espionage, the culprits firing, so be very, very quiet. We're hunting spies. So Washington was America's first spy master. He was intelligent enough to know he needed intelligence. And ultimately, he was able to enlist Talmadge to head the culprit spiring. Now, Talmadge was kind of a rock star. But here's a guy, he's third in command of the second light dragoons. He's running his spy ring. Uh, he's trying to keep himself from being caught or killed. Uh, he's a very, very busy guy. Now, he was originally from Long Island, and he used his Long Island connections uh, to set up the spy ring, uh, to operate on Long Island, gathering information on loyalist activities and plans, and sending agents down into New York to gather information there. They would get the information. They would pass it on in code by messages written in invisible ink. They used things like hollowed out musket balls that you could unscrew, put a message in there, screw it back together. It looked like a musket ball. Um, they used female agents like Anna Strong to help pass the uh, information along and it would be given to one of uh, Talmadge's old Long Island buddies, Caleb Brewster, who had also relocated to Connecticut. He was a spy, a whaleboat man and a privateer and very, very heavily involved in uh, Talmadge's culprit ring activities. The, uh, the intelligence would be transmitted back to Talmadge on the Connecticut side uh, so he could conduct raids on Long Island to destroy British supplies and fortifications. And where there are spies, there is treason. So Henry Clinton was the British commander in North America, uh, garrisoned in the city of Philadelphia and later in New York City after they moved from Philadelphia to New York in 1778. Uh, Continental Congress, who had run away, uh, was able to go back to Philly. Uh, they could get all the, now they could get all the cheese steaks and cream cheese they wanted. Uh, and, uh, and New York, uh, New York got Clinton. Now, John Andre gave the appearance of just being this addle headed fop, uh, being uh, uh, Clinton's party planner and what have you, but he was really the head of Clinton's intelligence agents. And he was also a good friend of Peggy Shippen, <clears throat> the daughter of a loyalist merchant in Philadelphia, who would later be Mrs. Benedict Arnold. So she caught Benedict's eye, he would woo her and wed her. And Arnold was probably the finest general in Washington's army, but he was a flawed individual. And he had some beefs against Congress and, and the military hierarchy. He had been passed over for promotions he felt he deserved, and he probably did deserve them. In the Northern campaign, he had laid out his own funds to help pay for uh, uh, an inland Navy basically on Lake Champlain to try and slow down the British uh, in their move down the Hudson Valley. Um, he would never be repaid. And so with his wounds, because he was wounded at Ridgefield, he was wounded at Saratoga, to recover from his wounds. I mean, the guy wound up with one leg two inches shorter than the other uh, and, and was in constant pain. And so Washington, thinking he's gonna do him a favor, puts him in charge of West Point, which puts Arnold in the fine position of having a real military nugget to sell to the British. So Andre goes up to get the plans to West Point Put, Arnold talks him into going back, not in uniform as he'd come up, but in civilian clothes. Uh, he takes the plans, he puts them in his boot, 
uh, which by the way, is if you're going to travel through disputed territory, that's where you're going to put your money too. You're not going to carry that in your pack or your, in, in your pocket or your haversack. So these three guys uh, find Arnold, uh, uh, Andre rather, headed back to, uh, towards New York. They stop him. He thinks they're loyalists and he says the wrong thing. They have him pull off his boots and they find the plans to West Point. They turn him over to Colonel John Jameson of the Second Light Dragoons. Uh, he's taken back to Tapan. Uh, where he is put on trial. He is held at, uh, at a tavern in uh, Old Tapan. Uh, that tavern is still there, by the way. It's the, uh, it's the 76 house. Uh, you can have dinner in the room where Andre was held. Uh, he became friendly with various of the officers of his guard. Uh, the petition was made to Washington at the end of the trial. Please don't hang this guy. But because of what happened to Nathan Hale, in 1775, uh, Washington said, no, a spy is a spy. He was, he was not in uniform. He was in civilian clothes. He was caught with the goods. And so he was taken and hung. Ultimately, as we know, the American side won. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this talk. And uh, the British called it The World Turned Upside Down. And that is allegedly the song that was played by the British field music as they surrendered at Yorktown. The British defeat at the Franco by the Franco-American army stunned the world. And as I said, the legend has it that they played the world turned upside down as the English army and its mercenaries laid down their arms in October of 1781. Now there's still actions to be fought out West, but they are for the most part minor activities. Uh, the major hostilities east of the Alleghenies has come to an end. Uh, now, even though the second dragoons were furloughed um, earlier in 1783, Washington toured the devastated Mohawk Valley uh, in July of that year, accompanied by a squadron of second dragoons. And then his farewell at uh, France's Tavern uh, in uh, November 1783, um, the portrait on the right is the farewell party. It looks like Washington is dancing. He's leading, of course, but I am told that's some kind of Masonic thing and not being a Mason, I cannot say anything about that. And the British went away. Washington and his entourage followed them to the docks. They boarded their waiting vessels, sailed out of New York Harbor, bye-bye Britskis, and the next phase of the great American experiment could begin. And in the aftermath, members of Sheldon's moved west to the uh, firelands that were created to uh, help people who had been burned out during July of 1780, uh, 1779. And so you find out in the Ohio Reserve, you find towns like Norwalk, Ohio, and Stratford, Ohio, and so on and so on. And the architecture from the, uh, from the late 18th, early 19th century is very, very much like what you find in colonial Connecticut. And I did a project trying to track um, how far west Sheldon's guys went in the aftermath of the war and taking their land bounties. And I found them as far west as Michigan and as far south as Alabama. Meanwhile, some stayed and just returned to their farms, former trades, what have you, became legislators, became members of heritage organizations uh, like the uh, Society of the Cincinnati for the officers and their descendants uh, and, uh, and just moved on with their lives. So let's talk about some of the guys. I mean, we're running close to uh, three o'clock here, but I need to tell you about some of the guys because it's not just it's not just facts and guns and clothes and whatnot. You talked about Sheldon a little bit. And we're gonna talk about, I, I wanna di divert to some of, his, some of his troubles. By 1779, some of his subordinate officers found his leadership style to be wanting. Now, part of it is because Sheldon kind of kept himself to himself 
Uh, and, and so when they complained he wasn't doing enough to equip and uniform and get horses for the regiment, actually he was trying to do that. He was constantly going back and forth between where he was uh, in the field and Hartford petitioning the Connecticut Assembly for the stuff he needed for his regiment. In one case, he kind of got ahead of the game and he purchased stuff out of his own pocket and then tried to get reimbursed and, and got court-martialed for fraud. He was exonerated, but you know, you, you're trying to win a war and you don't really have time for that kind of nonsense. But there was also a question about him not being aggressive enough. Um, Captain Stoddard, um, who would lead the, the troop into Norwalk, um, was the prime mover behind putting together a letter that some 18 of Sheldon's officers would wind up signing, calling on him to resign his position as Colonel of the regiment for lack of aggressiveness and inattentiveness to, to details and not doing this and not doing that. And they forward a copy of that letter with their own, bolstered by their own letter of complaint directly to Washington. Talmadge wound up brokering a deal between those officers and, and Sheldon. Sheldon stayed on for the rest of the war, but Talmadge wound up acting as an intermediary between the dissatisfied faction and Sheldon because they were just not having it on with each other. At the end of the war, he moved his family in 1791 to the town of Hungerford in Franklin County, Vermont, uh, where the Sheldon home still stands. Town changed its name to Sheldon, Vermont in 1792. His Connecticut home in Litchfield is part of the Litchfield Historic District, along with that of his brother, Thomas Sheldon, and the former home of, of Benjamin Talmadge. He died in St. Albans, Vermont, and is buried next to his wife, Sarah Bellows. And the Sheldon Family Association still meets annually. To, to catch up, to socialize, and to honor the memory of their Revolutionary War ancestor. Now, Benjamin Talmadge was one of the rock stars of the Revolution, a native of Long Island. He came to Connecticut to attend Yale College, where he befriended, among others, fellow student Nathan Hale. He also kind of convinced Nathan that he would be the right guy to work as an espionage agent for George Washington. Bad choice. Anyway, after hostilities broke out, uh, Talmadge enlisted in the 6th Connecticut Militia and joined his regiment to march to Boston after Lexington and Concord. He joined his regiment to go down to New York City, took part in the Battle of Brooklyn Heights, where he would be one of the last men to withdraw from the Brooklyn shore. In an act of reckless bravado that would characterize this guy throughout his career. He enlisted some of his regiment and some boatmen to go back in the dead of night to retrieve a horse he left behind. He was successful and that act brought him to the attention of Washington and his staff, including a young Alexander Hamilton. So when Washington commissioned the second dragoons in December of 1776, Two days later, after the commissioning, he appointed Talmadge to a position in the regiment. He would rise to the ranks to become major and eventually the executive officer of the regiment. He would campaign largely in the area between Northern Westchester and the Bronx as the uh, disputed territories or no man's land with the cowboys, which were loyalist freebooters and skinners, rebel or patriot freebooters looted at will. And starting in 1778, he would use his Long Island connections, as I said before, to form one of Washington's most successful espionage networks known as the Culper Ring. So successful were the members of the Culper Ring at keeping their identities secret that their names would not be revealed until 1939 when Long Island historian Morton Pennypacker, yes, Morton Pennypacker, <laughs> noted a similarity in the writing of Robert Townsend and that of a Culper Ring agent 
who operated under the code name of Samuel Culper. And of course, Samuel, Samuel Culper Jr. rather. Culper Jr. was Robert Townsend. And, and then all of a sudden this information started to come to light. Talmadge survived being wounded uh, and, uh, and also survived being very, very close to being captured. As I said, he, he and his regiment became hunted by the British, most notoriously by Bannister Tarleton. He would use his boyhood knowledge and connections in Long Island and the information from the Culper spy ring to lead a series of highly successful raids against loyalist strongholds and supply depots throughout the last few years of the war. He would serve through to the end in the Second Dragoons. After the war, he took up residence in the town of Litchfield, where he became the town postmaster in 1792, first treasurer of the Connecticut chapter of the Society of the Cincinnati, and later secretary. He held various offices in the state society, including president, and would be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives and served from 1801 to 1817. He established a successful trading company and was the first president of the Phoenix Branch Bank from 1814 to 1826. He married Mary Floyd, daughter of William Floyd, a signer of the Declaration of Independence and a U.S. representative from New York State. They remained married until her death in 1805. Among their children were officers in the U.S. Army and Navy and congressional representatives. He died March 7, 1835 in Litchfield and is buried in the East Cemetery. There are SAR and DAR chapters named in honor of the respective Talmages. Thomas Young Seymour proves, as I said before, that it's good to be friends with an artist because he's got portraits all over the place. Now, he was born in Hartford in 1757, graduated Yale in the class of 77. He had been among that first Connecticut light horse militia sent to, New, sent to Washington and New York, but sent home because of being fighter jocks. He joined the 2nd Dragoons in January of 1777 as a lieutenant. And later that year, his troop, along with a troop of the 4th Connecticut light horse, was sent north to join General Gates's Northern Army to block the southward movement of a 9,000 man force under General Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne. In August, his troop was sent to the Mohawk Valley village of Skahari to blunt the wholesale coat turning of the 3rd Albany County militia over to the Loyalist side. They captured the renegades and performed the first cavalry charge by a United States Army Cavalry Regiment on American soil. They returned to Gates's camp in time for the Battle of Saratoga, Freeman's Farm and Bemis Heights, where they served under General Morgan and his riflemen, and under Benedict Arnold to achieve victory over Burgoyne's army of British loyalists, Hessians, and Native Americans. His actions earned him the sobriquet of Le Beau Sabreur, meaning the beautiful swordsman, and was promoted to captain as a result. In the wake of the British defeat, Seymour was selected to head the party, escorting the paroled British officers their wives and or paramours to Boston. Seymour and Burgoyne forged a close personal relationship on their journey, at the end of which Burgoyne did two things. One, he gifted Seymour a leopard skin saddle blanket, which Seymour would use on ceremonial occasions for the rest of his life, and two, file a complaint with Washington about the horrible treatment he and his entourage had endured. Returning to his regiment on the Westchester front and dissatisfied by his perception of Sheldon's leadership style, Seymour resigned his commission to return home in late 1778. He married Marianne Ledyard in August of 1781. One month later, his newly minted brother-in-law, Colonel Ledyard, would be slain while surrendering his sword to forces under Benedict Arnold at Fort Griswold in Groton, New York. I'm going to skip over David Edgar. Let's go to Captain George Hurlbut. Now, he came from New London, born around 1756, uh, went to Boston after the Lexington and Concord alarm, joined the 2nd Dragoons as a cornet in April of 77, and by August 1st of 1779, he was a captain. <clears throat> On the night of July 
15, 1781 while stationed at Dobbs Ferry. Hurlbut would, would participate in what would be the first combined arms operation between Americans and the French against Crown forces in Tarrytown, New York, known as the action at Tarrytown. I, I don't know how they think this stuff up. So here's the story. Five American river sloops carrying cannons, food, and other supplies down from West Point to the Tarrytown docks on the east side of the Hudson. They're there to supply 10,000 plus Franco-American troops camped at Phillipsburg and Greenberg. Well, the British can't let the Americans have nice things. So they sent two sloops of war, two tenders, and a galley to intercept the vessels and destroy their cargoes. Hoping to be as successful as they were the previous night when they took Captain William Dobbs's boat loaded with 1,000 bread rations and clothing intelligent for Sheldon's regiment. Seeing the British ships, the cargo boats headed for shore, but three ran aground 100 yards from safety. The British dropped anchor and began a bombardment under which the Americans were frantically trying to offload the supplies. The British sent two gunboats and four barges loaded with troops to seize the supplies and fire the rebel vessels. The only allied troops on hand was a sergeant's guard of 12 musket men from the French Soissonne Regiment who put up a brisk fire hard enough to keep the gunboats at bay. Now Sheldon said his Dobbs Ferry headquarters. He's alerted and sent Captain Hurlbut with 12 troopers the seven miles north of Tarrytown. As soon as they arrived, they dismounted and taking up positions in one of the grounded sloops began to assist in unloading and protecting the precious supplies. Overwhelmed by superior gunfire, Hurlbut ordered his men to jump overboard and swim to shore. The British swarmed around the grounded vessels and set them afire, but the volley fire from the Sheldons prevented them from looting or destroying the cargoes. But the flames were still a danger, so Hurlbut and a Captain Lieutenant John Miles of the 2nd Continental Artillery and a Quartermaster Lieutenant named Joseph Shaler of the 4th Connecticut swam toward the burning ships, extinguishing the flames and rescued all the ships and most of the cargo. But a British ball had caught Hurlbut in the leg while he was in the water. Now the British tried to loiter in the area, but they were driven off after a few days due to French and American artillery fire. Meanwhile, Hurlbut was treated for his wound at the Van Tassel Inn. Yeah, those Van Tassels. This is before the incident with Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman. Anyway, he may well have been visited by Washington to commend him for his bravery. Or at least that's what some of the writings show. Although records show he recovered from his wound, he may not have recovered from the infection. Whether induced by his wound or from another source, there is some claim that after recovering, he may have fallen from his horse and reopened the original wound. In any event, he was from then on, he was under considerable pain. And as a result, he was never able to return to active duty. By April of 1783, he had been ordered home to New London to fully recuperate. He only lived until May 8th. He is buried in his hometown cemetery with a gravestone that reads, the dust of Captain George Hurlbut, who died May 8th, 1783, in the 28th year of his age, in consequence of a wound he received in service of his country. Here lies a youth of valor, known and tried who in his country's cause fought, bled, and died. Elijah Churchill entered this world in 1755 in Newington, Connecticut. It is doubtful that any of his family could envision that their relative would be among the very first to receive a national honor. His first enlistment was in the 8th Connecticut in July of 1775. With the expiration of his term, he re-enlisted as a corporal in the 2nd Light Dragoons and was elevated to sergeant on October 2nd, 1780. He would be cited for gallery for gall gallantry for his actions at Fort St. George on Long Island in 1780, as well as actions at Tarrytown, New York in 1781, and Fort Slongo, uh, also on Long Island in 1781. For his bravery, he would be one of the first three men, all from Connecticut, as it turns out, to be awarded the badge of military merit in the form of a Purple Heart 
forerunner to the Congressional Medal of Honor. We're running late, so I'm going to skip some of the details. Um, but I will say this, if you have an interest, you can go to Long Island and you can have lunch or dinner at Elisha Sheldon's Tavern on the North Shore of Long Island. And now the last man I'm going to talk about is the last man. Lemuel Cook. At the age of 102, Lemuel Cook would be the last man of the 2nd Regiment Light Dragoons to pass away in 1866. His story can be found in the book, The Revolution's Last Men, The Soldiers Behind the Photographs by Don Hagist. Cook joined the 2nd Dragoons in 1780, as soon as he turned 16, and he left his Western Connecticut home of Northbury, where he had been recruited by Captain Hurlbut while part of the regiment was in winter quarters in Simsbury in Windsor, Connecticut. After completing his training, he was assigned, due to a lack of mounts, to the 6th Troop, one of the two dismounted light infantry troops under Captain William Staunton. Shortly thereafter, Staunton was moved to lead one of the mountain tro mounted troops, by which time Cook had received from one of his had received one of his family's horses, thanks mom and dad, and so became part of the mounted troop. As part of his related biography, Cook opined that on one occasion, General Washington complimented him on the quality of that horse. Cook's troop was detailed to accompany Washington and Rochambeau as they scouted the area around Southern Westchester, the Bronx, and Kingsbridge, New York. When the joint Franco-American army proceeded southward on their way to Yorktown, Cook was among 20 of Sheldon's troopers on command. As a result, he was there for the victory over Lord Cornwallis on the York River. After returning from Yorktown, Cook assumed duties in the regiment's quartermaster department and was stationed at Greenfield Hill in Fairfield, being also one of Talmadge's observation points for activities on Long Island. He would eventually move from Connecticut to his wartime bounty land in the Western New York, in Western New York State, where he would apply for and receive a pension. His descendants related the following in regard to their Revolutionary War relative. In the year before his death, he would still ride his horse around his property and around the town. He smoked cigarettes, cigars, used snuff, and chewed tobacco. He drove from his farm to the town of Clarendon to celebrate Decoration Day to honor Civil War dead. For many years, it was believed that Cook was the oldest and last surviving veteran of the American War for Independence of the regular army. Later valid claims see, seem to have supplanted him by a guy or two in that regard. Nonetheless, Cook was the last man standing of the second regiment light dragoons. Here is a man who by the time of his death had seen his young country separate itself violently from its motherland. He lived to witness how the French took the notion of liberty and turned it into a bloodbath. He witnessed the XYZ affair, the clash with the Barbary pilots, pirates, the War of 1812, the death of Americans in Texas at the Alamo, the Mexican-American War of the 1840s. He saw the land he fought to build torn asunder during the four years of carnage of the Civil War. And he lived to see the victory over the South, the extermination of slavery in the United States, and the reuniting of his country. His eyes may well have been those of the last man of the regular army to have gazed upon George Washington, the father of our country. I think the passing of the last trooper is a fitting place to bring this presentation to a close. Thank you for zooming in and thank you for listening. Thank you, Eric. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, you know, it, it makes you appreciate, you know, all that was done early on to uh, protect our country. It, it's just um, absolutely amazing. Um, we do have some questions in the, um, in the chat. Um, the first one, what kind of horses breed type were the best for cavalry? Um, Arab bred quarter horses. Okay. Um, Khalib Gibbs of the Light Guards protected Washington. What is their relationship to the Sheldon's horse if they were, the, if they were with Washington? So the, the lifeguards was um, a distinct element of its own. 
um, uh, the uh, they existed before the 20 troopers of Sheldon's were put on command to accompany Washington down south. So they they were all part of the overall protective detail that would have also included members of von Hare's um, von Hare's corps. Um, I'm groping for a term. Uh, basically, von Harris was uh, the police of the army. I mean, there were no military police per se, but von Harris Corps acted in that kind of uh, that kind of capacity. So there there were multiple overlapping bodies uh, doing the same kinds of things. Provost Corps, von Harris Provost Corps. That's the word I was groping desperately for. So yes, you had the lifeguard, you had the provost corps, and and you had these twenty guys from Sheldon's who accompanied, and all some of them acted as his clerks, as well as being part of a bodyguard. All right, we have another question. Uh, do you know the reason why he objected to providing money to the three militia captors of John Andre? So there was some question as to whether they were loyalists who, seeing a civilian, ostensibly, were just looking to, to fill their pockets with whatever this guy had, whether they were actually on the, what we would now call the Patriot side or, or the rebels, um, or whether they were just banditti because the neutral ground where all this occurred, um, it, was, it was the Wild West for all intents and purposes. So there was some question about the actual degree of loyalty of these three individuals. All right. Um, are there any other questions? Um, has everybody entered in the chat? Um, Eric, is there anything else that you want to uh, say? Just that... It's, it's remarkable how much stuff actually went, around, went on in, in this part of our world. You know, if, if, you're, if you're going down the Post Road, if you're on High Ridge Road, if you're on Long Ridge Road, uh, if you're on Route 22, um, you are where stuff happened. Uh, we, hear, you know, we hear so much about Lexington and Concord and Boston and Brooklyn and Yorktown and Saratoga. Um, significant stuff happened here in Connecticut. Large scale, scale significant stuff happened here in Connecticut. Uh, the, the Danbury Ridgefield uh, uh, um, battles were always kind of treated as, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, a minor thing that happened. Uh, but as more research is done uh, and as more documentation has come to light over the years, uh, that was much more significant than originally thought. Uh, the same with Norwalk. Norwalk was, uh, you know, oh, yeah, so that happened in Norwalk. Um, it was much more significant in terms of numbers and damage done than originally thought. Same with Pound Ridge. Pound Ridge was considered as, you know, just as a minor skirmish. It was part of an overall campaign. Uh, and that was intended to do major damage to Washington, to the second dragoons, to the militia in the area. I mean, 360 men on the British side, another 90 on the American side, packed into that sardine can of a road. That's a significant activity. And as far as Norwalk goes, years later, when Washington passed through Norwalk, he could he said he could still smell the smoke from 1779. So stuff happened here. Absolutely. Stuff happened here. That's incredible. We have another comment. Um, what about the first, third, and fourth horse regiments? Any comments about those? Okay, so um, first was from Virginia. Um, uh, the fourth was from New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, the third, Baylor's Dragoons. They were massacred uh, over in New Jersey. They were taken by surprise by British General No Flint Gray. He earned his nickname at the Battle of Piole 
uh, when he took the light, the American Light Infantry Camp uh, with his men armed with muskets with no flints in the jaws and only bayonets. And he did the same thing to Baylor's men. Um, uh, at least a third of them were killed outright uh, at Bayonet Point. Uh, they took Baylor prisoner, wounded. Uh, the dead guys, they dumped down a well. Um, Moylan's was, was effective. Moylan eventually, of the 4th Dragoons, he eventually became the overall dra uh, Dragoon commander uh, overseeing the, the four congressionally constituted Dragoon regiments, along with Armand's Legion and so on. Um, all all very effective in their own way. Um, and of course, the first Dragoons would eventually be taken over by George Washington's nephew, William Washington, who was himself a hell of a cavalryman. All right, you, you have imparted some great information and knowledge to everyone. Um, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, okay. and thank you again, Eric, for a wonderful presentation. You're welcome. Um, and thank you all for coming.